Hey guys, today's episode is with Miles Snyder. So Miles is a friend of mine. He is a chef and he is also a co-founder of Mother Tongue. So uh, Mother Tongue is a company he started with his brother. They're both chefs and their mission is to help get more people cooking at home. So as part of their company, which is partly educational, so make sure you follow them on Instagram at at cook mother tongue. And then their website also is cookmothertongue.com. but they have tons of resources on there to get you started on cooking, to help you become a better cook and learn how you can be healthier simply by cooking at home. Um, as part of their company, they also have spice blends that they sell at cookmothertongue.com. They are so good. I have them myself. I've been using them nonstop. Um, I tried them at a retreat that I met miles at. He was the chef at this retreat and it was just so amazing. Everyone was dying over the food. So make sure you snag some of their spices. I'll put a link um, in the show notes for you to get that. But what I really love about miles and the reason that I asked him to come on the podcast is because I love his philosophy about food. His attitude towards food is so healthy and well-rounded. Um, he's going to share his experience with, um, getting some, some digestive issues after some time out of the country, um, how he healed that. He's also going to share his experience on how to get started at, at cooking at home and why it matters like why that matters. I think you're going to leave this conversation inspired. I know you are. Cause I am myself. I'm like, can't wait to cook dinner tonight after interviewing him. So, um, yeah, we'll go ahead and jump right into it. Here is miles Snyder. So I want to tell you guys about one of my favorite finds in the health industry in the last few years. It's something I use with all my clients and that has been extremely impacting on me as well. And that's the upgraded formulas, hair mineral tests, their consults and their nanoparticle size minerals. So, um, I started on this path because I was taking in a high quality magnesium. And when I tested, I found out that I was extremely deficient in magnesium. And once I started using their nanoparticle size magnesium, my levels went right up. And what I experienced was incredible. I started getting more REM sleep. I was, I realized I hadn't been dreaming in years, started dreaming again, and also noticed that I didn't think I had anxiety until I got my magnesium back up and noticed that I was experiencing quite a lot of anxiety and that went away and I was able to enter back into a place of calm and peace. And, um, it was just incredible. And so since then I've been using it with all of my clients and it's so easy. All you have to do, they'll mail you out a little envelope and you just put some hair in it and mail it back into their lab. And then you do a consult with them over the phone and they'll tell you all about your ratios, what's high and what's low, because you can't know this unless you test, there's no way to know. And you can't just crap shoot minerals. You have to make sure that your ratios are on point. So they will tell you exactly what you need more of exactly what you need less of to get those ratios on point. So you can have optimized brain health and hormones and sleep and metabolism. So, um, they're also giving you 10% off for being an inside out health listener. So that code is just inside out. So, um, go to upgradedformulas.com and just enter inside out at checkout and you'll get 10% off their consults, um, the hair tests and any products that you may need to get your ratios. Right. So, um, yeah, take advantage of it guys. It's something I use with every single one of my clients. It's been wildly impacting and I'm happy to be able to extend that discount onto you guys too, as a thank you for listening to the podcast. All right. Hey miles. All right. So I want to, I want to start right off with talking about what is the mission of mother tongue, because I think it's so important. I don't want anybody to miss this. So listen guys, cause I, I hope that as you guys are listening to this, that you will start thinking about how not only you can start doing this more, what miles is about to tell you, but also like how to encourage people in your life more. So yeah. Can you enlighten us? Like what is your mission at mother tongue? Yeah, absolutely. So my brother and I started this company to get more people cooking at home. And that means to help them cook more often at home to cook more confidently at home, to cook more creatively at home. And the reason being is that we we, we were both uh, professional chefs that transitioned away from cooking in professional kitchens and we became really dedicated home cooks. And I think both of us, we also grew up in a family where cooking was very important. So it's a big part of our background and our culture. But both of us have this deep belief in the power of home cooking and how that can really transform people's lives. And there's a lot of different layers to that. Um, the first and most obvious being that cooking at home, it, you know, it saves you money and it allows you to eat a lot healthier, which yeah. I think for a lot of people is the reason they start cooking at home in the first place. They're like, oh, you know, I can't eat out all the time because it's, it's unhealthy and it's going to cost me a lot. So they start, you know, just cooking at home, very basic for those two reasons. And those are really important reasons and they're great reasons to cook at home. But I think once you kind of start doing that, that's like the gateway drug into all these other benefits that cooking has to offer. Um, and one of those that I have been thinking a, a lot about recently is just this idea that 
we in today's day and age, we're so digital and so distracted and we spend so much of our time in front of a screen kind of interacting with people um, just via these like technological mediums. You're on Slack all day, you're on your phone, you're on, your, you're on social media. And one of the things I love about cooking is that it takes you out of all of that and puts you back in touch with the physical realm. So yep. you're in the present moment, you are um, touching things, you're using all of your senses, you know, you're, you're touching, smelling, tasting, feeling, hearing, yeah. all that yeah. stuff. And it, it really grounds you and I think connects yeah. you. And I think that like, as humans, we really crave and need those kinds of experiences. Um, and it's the reason why people love things like painting or doing pottery or whatever it is, like anything where you're really using your hands and you're in the present moment um, and you can kind of get into that flow state. And I think cooking is certainly that's the it for me. And I think it can be that for a lot of people. And so the final thing that I think is like really interesting with regards to cooking at home is that you do all of those things and you maybe you, you know, you go from cooking just to save money to actually cooking because you really enjoy the process and it's creative and you get to create something from scratch. Um, but I think the final component is this idea that cooking is this catalyst for like community. Um, so like I've had people who I lived with who were roommates who never cooked and then I was cooking a lot at home. So they started learning and they like throw dinner parties now, you know? Yeah. And I think this idea that you can cook a meal and have people over and you sit down around a table and it brings people together and yeah. you, you know, facilitate conversations and all that. And that I think is in addition to sort of needing people to get out of the digital realm and, you know, get back to um, being present and using their senses. I think there's a very big need in the world right now for those community experiences totally. and food and cooking are the ultimate community experience. And actually to kind of bring it full circle, that's why we called the company Mother Tongue. A lot of people ask us like, what is the, the meaning behind the name? And it is the idea that, you know, someone's mother tongue is their first language. And we consider food everyone's first language. It's a universal language. Like you can actually, yeah. you can tell someone, uh, you know, you love them without even saying that because you prepare yep. them a, a homemade meal. You could meet someone from somewhere and not speak the same language, but share a meal together or cook for them. And it's such a powerful um, message that everyone understands. Yeah. So that is the high level mission. And I think there's, there's small steps, you know, because different people are, are in different places in their cooking journey. There's people who, um, you know, who've gotten in touch with us who never cooked at home before. And then there's people who have plenty of experience, but we want to help everyone just kind of move further along in that path. Um, and just reap all of those benefits of cooking at home. Yeah. I love, I love what you said about like it being like basically saying, I love you, like cooking for someone yeah. is saying, I love you. And, you know, we, we met at a, what would you call it? Sort of a mastermind retreat kind of thing. And you were, yeah, you were the like chef that. and, and wow. Like honestly, just you, you and the people that were helping you cook the food really set the tone for the entire retreat because it was like, look how much love we brought to you guys. Look how we went the extra mile and got this really special bread for you guys for this part. And like, look how the way you were teaching people like dude this is so cool all you have to do is just do this this and this and it, it brought so much um connection so much love and it's you know everybody there like loved you because you were like first giving love by showing all this awesome food and it, it is it's a love language you know so i it love really that is. um and you know i think of you're, as you're talking about this, I love to cook too. And I know what you're talking about. It's the, it's, yeah. it's the combination of being in flow state. You're just sitting there like chopping vegetables. I think is like the most therapeutic thing in the it world. Totally it's like your pure presence. Um, but at, at the same time, like you're expressing your creativity and, and that's what I love to see come out and people when they, I'm sure you've seen it so many times, like when somebody's like, I don't know how to cook at all. And then they get to the point where they like, they added some sort of crazy ingredient that felt like off the rules off the, and they're like, yeah. Oh my gosh, this is so good. Like there's so much joy in that moment for all of us. So it's like, it's the combination of like, almost like meditation and creative expression at the same Absolutely. time. And I, um, because among so many of my friends, I'm kind of like the cooking guy. I get those texts all the time where it's like, they'll send me a picture and be like, I made yeah. this. And <laughs> I, I can't even express to people how happy that makes me. Like it makes my day every time someone does that. And one of the coolest things about starting Mother Tongue was the fact that like, 
we've actually had people who I've never met, who I don't even know, who have bought the products and like emailed us or DM'd us on Instagram saying, hey, I cooked this recipe that you guys posted. And that is like, yeah, such a cool feeling. So cool. And okay, here's one thing I want to add, because I, so I have done as a health coach, like I've helped people grocery shop that who have never cooked before and like brought it home with them. And it's like a foreign language to them, you know, like one of the guys who's like, this is like walking on Mars for me. Like I literally, I have no (laughs) idea, like what you're going to do with that spinach. Like what happens to the spinach? You know, (laughs) I had an old roommate who like (laughs) never used salt. Yeah. His cooking. Like he didn't even know that that was a thing. Wow. Yeah. This, this guy, he, he only had salt and pepper. Those are the only two spices that he possessed yeah. and everything was kind of packaged, you know, and it really opened my eyes and my dad, my dad's been, you know, my parents have been divorced since I was like a toddler. So my dad's been this like single dude, like most of his mm-hmm. life. And he, he's in this uh, belief system of, I don't know how to cook. Like kind of like, I can't cook is actually what yep. he says. I can't cook. And I'm always like, Oh, oh, well, you just have to like, like read a recipe and like (laughs) do what it says and start there. So that's my next question is like, when somebody is like, I can't cook. Right. And and I think it's this, this barrier of like, I don't even know where to start. Like, I don't know what pans you use or like, like what, what would you recommend to somebody who doesn't even know where to start? Totally. And I, I very much understand how it like it it's such a massive world the the culinary world and all these different things you can do that it can be overwhelming to people. However, I'd start with saying this, I firmly believe that everything can be learned. And not just everything. with cooking. I believe that about everything. Totally. Like I don't even like when people say, you know, I'm not naturally good at yeah. X or I can't cook. Right? Because it's it, it if you believe that, it will be true for you. But if you don't believe that, um you know, you can do anything. And I think it's really a matter of like where you decide, like, I think anything can be learned, but it's a matter of where you um, allocate your bandwidth towards, towards spending time learning it. Right. And I think if cooking is something you, that you, that you do want to get better at, um, then you just have to, to take the time. And yeah, there, there's a few things. Um, it, I would say if you're really kind of serious about learning how to cook, um, I would, say the number one thing you have to do is it's it's like reps just cook as much as you can yeah. cook you know one meal a day every single day for the next few months yeah. um another really useful thing to do is something that that i do uh, almost religiously now is like keep a cooking journal and you can do it in like evernote or apple notes or whatever but just every time you cook make some notes about like what temperature you cooked it at how you did it um, you know, what you liked about it, what you didn't like about it, because you'll notice that you, if you want to do something similar or do the same thing again, you don't always remember exactly how you did it. So if you write those things down, you'll know. Um, and that really helps for going back and cooking the same thing over again or or cooking similar things. Um, but I think like, I guess there are so many different things that you kind of have to learn, but the basics are very simple. Um, one, I would say shameless plug, like go follow us on Instagram because we try and talk about everything from like talking about different pantry staples that we like to what kind of um, cool. like cookware and pans we use and all that. Nice. Cause there's a lot of information you can just absorb. Um, Is it just at mother tongue? It's Straight at out? cook mother tongue. Cook mother tongue. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. And yeah, yeah. And that's, that's the, that's the first thing you like the, the guy with the spinach, like he was, I was like, Oh, can you just fry that? Can you just saute that up? And he's like, in like, it, like on the stove, like in a, in a pan, you know what I mean? And I was yeah. like, Oh yes. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Like even just thinking of putting oil in a pan, like was like foreign to him. Cause he just doesn't totally. do that. Right. So it was a good, like wake up call for me. Um, one thing that I really liked about, about you when at this cooking experience is that sometimes when people are like, Oh, I'm a chef. Like I do, you know, I went to culinary school and blah, blah, blah. Like, usually I find that I'm, I'm then, uh, uh, I, I, what I experience next is all these like crazy ingredients I've never heard before. I've never cooked with them. I don't even know what they are, or it's this really like off the wall, random thing. And that leaves me like impressed. It leaves me impressed, but it also leaves me feeling like I could never recreate it. Or that if I wanted to cook really well, that I would have to like become a chef or something. Right. And what yeah. I really appreciated about you is that our food was crazy good, but it was so simple. Like, yeah. do you do that intentionally? Cause I know that, you know, like you could like put all these crazy ingredients, but you, it was like, you were emphasizing the simplicity of that. You know, why, why do yeah. you choose that? I'd say the, the further I've gone in my own personal journey as a chef, the more of like a minimalist I've become, cool. um, which is really interesting. And I think ultimately it stems from 
my food philosophy, which is something that I credit my mother with. My mom is an incredible chef. Um, and so I grew up around food, but the, the number one thing she imparted on me, which is more than any like technique or recipe or how to do something was a philosophy of food, which is that the primary ingredients matter, you know, the difference yeah. between an, you know, an out of season tomato that you pick up from a farmer's market and an right. in season, or sorry, an out of season tomato that you pick up from a grocery store yeah. and an in season tomato that you get from a farmer's market is profound. Yes. And so the, the, the truth is um, you can, I, I think that the, the best way to make things taste good is actually to keep it very simple, but seek out the best quality ingredients mm. possible. And when I, when I like cook, whether it's for like a, a pop-up event or just like kind of want to do a special meal for some friends and family and all that, like my guiding philosophy is always like, what would this look like if I found the best quality you know, most um, locally sourced ingredients possible. And yeah. I think if you do that, you really don't have to do much to the food at all to make it taste really good. Right. Um, <laughs> like there's a, there are chefs out there who want to sort of manipulate food in all of these crazy ways and add all of these different like sauces and condiments and ingredients and all of that. And there's, there's room for those things, but ultimately you should allow like the primary ingredients to express themselves um yeah. fully and like yeah. some of the best chefs that I've ever had the the um, pleasure of eating their food were like you know grandmas in Mexico who you know don't own any restaurants but uh you know just cook incredible meals with the amazing ingredients that they have access to I'm so jealous I'm so yeah so tell us what yeah. you, you went to culinary school in Mexico correct yeah so I I had kind of like an interesting path I I went to college in New York City and then when I graduated I wanted to go to cooking school. I, like I said, I grew up in a family where food and cooking was very important. I was cooking, you know, from the time yeah. I was young, but didn't necessarily think I wanted to, to be a chef. Um, but after graduating college, I, I, I had, it's, when I moved out of the house and didn't have my mom's mom cooking for me anymore, my interest <laughs> in food, like really skyrocketed <laughs> again, because I was like, oh man, I really like, I, Necessity I was spoiled in. growing up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I just had such, I had such good food growing up. Um, uh. So I graduated and I went to cooking school in Mexico City because I found a really interesting program that was, it was only six months long, which I didn't really want to go to like a yeah. four year cooking school that was going to cost a ton of money. Right. Um, and it was actually specifically about regional Mexican food, which is oh. really cool because yeah, I, um, I think Mexican cuisine is it's my personal favorite. And I also think it's among the most interesting in the world. Like even yeah. I've studied it like from an anthropological perspective and it's cool. just fascinating all the different regions and the history and the immigration patterns that led to it and the combining of, you know, the sort of like old world ingredients with what the Spaniards brought. And it's just, it's fascinating. Um, yeah, I, so I did that. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, I, I, so I have a degree in Spanish. So I, I spent a lot oh, of my life, yeah, a lot of my life, I very, very immersed in Mexican and other South American and Central American, you know, cultures, or I guess I should say Latin American cultures. And I lived in Spain and I, you know, it's been a big part of my life. And I always tell my kids, I'm like, guys, like somebody, we've got to create some sort of like uh, organization worldwide. So we can just award Mexico with winning food. You guys won, <laughs> like you won, like they need a trophy. They need a prize. Like who can grant 100%. them this? <laughs> there, there, there is some like international, like cultural heritage organization okay. <laughs> that gave Mexico some prize Yay. along those lines. I'll, I'll, okay, have to, I'll have to send it to you later. Cause it's, it's hilarious <laughs> that you say that. Cause, it, but it's true. I mean, the the more you dive into it, it's it's so fascinating all of the like different regional cuisines and how different they are and how, uh, I mean just the amount of, the number of ingredients that originated in Mexico corn tomatoes beans chilies all these different types of herbs and spices like it's such a biodiverse um, yeah part of the world and I could I could talk about this for days I'm absolutely obsessed um, and so. That's why, that's why I chose to go to cooking school there. And then when I graduated cooking school, I got a job at a restaurant in Tulum, Mexico called Heartwood. That cool. is, it's not a Mexican restaurant because the chef is actually an American, but he uses 
he sources almost everything um, locally. So it's very Mexican influenced. And it was, you know, I got the opportunity to work with all these incredible ingredients from that part of Mexico. Um, and in addition, it's an open fire restaurant. So it's wood fired grill, wood fired oven. There's, Ugh. there's no stove or like, you know, dials to turn. Wow. So it was a really cool place to like, learn how to cook professionally because you had to learn to cook with intuition you know you can't like just turn something up and down you had to feel the fire yeah. or feel into the oven and know how hot things oh. were um so it was it was absolutely incredible it was, it was like really it's hard work working down there you know it's like long hours it's hot yeah. it's physical um but to kind of loop back to what we were talking about earlier like i it, it was it was the like physical physically the hardest like job I, I had had at that point because the hours were so long and it was like so hot there and all of that but I actually missed that quite a bit because all day every day I was cooking so it was in that sort of creative flow zone that we talked about you you know you're using your hands all day and you're um you know like working with fire and and all yeah. that and it, it like it at the end of the day you felt so accomplished and tired in that like really good way wow um just serving and giving love like all day is what totally. it sounds like i'm actually headed to, to loom in a couple of months uh, for a girl's oh, yeah? trip so i'm like yep that's where we will be going <laughs> absolutely so i'll also uh, i'll send you my i have a whole list of because Tulum oh, okay. has become really like a, a food hub within mexico um, <laughs> for a bunch of reasons. So there's like, there's a few really, really world-class restaurants down there now. I'm going to get so many questions. People are going to be emailing me. Can you have him, can you share me, share that list with me? For <laughs> I'm happy look? to share it with whoever wants it. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. One other question, I, or I yeah. just, something I really wanted you to hit on that we talked about uh, before was you talking about your own health journey and healing with yeah. food. And we talked about like kind of staying stuck in this place of healing. Can you share your journey with that? Yeah, absolutely. So when I, um, after I cooked at Hartwood, I spent some time in Oaxaca, Mexico. Um, and while I was in Oaxaca, I got food poisoning on like a level you like can't even imagine. Like it was, it was, it was the worst food poisoning I'd ever gotten in my entire life. And this is like just a few weeks before I, I ended up coming back home. Um, and so I had this like 48 hour, just like terrible food poisoning. And then I kind of just didn't get better after that for a long time. Um, and, you know, it, initially it was just this, like, it, I went from, you know, having a, a pretty uh, healthy digestive system to just having, you know, every digestive issue you could imagine. Um, and as anyone who's experienced those kind of health issues know, it really affects you at a very, very deep level. Um, it's like when I think about those first six months after coming back from Mexico, it was kind of a dark place in my life. I was super, super mentally foggy. I was yep. tired all the time. I was yep. irritable. Um, I was, you know, not necessarily in the like clinically depressed sense of the word, but I was felt depressed, you know? For sure. Yeah, um, absolutely. You would and, be. Yeah. And I, I felt like it, like I was living life on like 60% versus 100%, you know? Um, yeah. And, and let me just, can I, sorry to yeah. interrupt. Let me just interject. No, no. If, if anybody isn't familiar, like you're all of your health centers in your gut. So when your gut is inflamed, your, your brain will be inflamed and you can't make neurotransmitters that keep you happy. So literally like what, what miles is saying here is like, you, you couldn't be happy because you didn't have the chemicals available to you because your gut environment was toxic to be able to make enough serotonin GABA things that keep you happy. So yeah, like anybody who has gut issues, I just, I have to interject that because I'm shocked how many people don't know the connection between gut issues and mental health. So if you're sad and feeling down and brain fogging, you just don't give a crap about life and all of that. And you have gut issues, keep listening. <laughs> like you yeah, got to yeah. get your gut issues fixed in order to feel happy again. <laughs> yeah. And if you're eating the standard American diet, you probably have gut issues because it's, it's, right. it's going to contribute to that. Yep. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was just like a, a really tough time. And I, and I kind of for a while just waited it out, hoping and expecting to, to get better. But then I, right. I kind of reached this point where I was like, really, you know, I was like, I need to, to do something about this. Um, one of the other things that was like part of the, the most depressing thing for me was that in addition to just feeling terrible all the time, I lost this ability to get joy out of food, which was something that I had, was so profound yeah. for me. 
because I couldn't eat things without feeling terrible afterwards. Right. Um, and I just yeah. started, you know, eliminating everything. And, and then there was this sense of like fear and worry every time yeah. that I would eat something. And I know that that, you know, in hindsight, I know that contributed to having a, a worse reaction to it. So um, fast forward a few months and I ended up actually getting linked up with Chris Kresser, who's awesome. pretty well known in the community now. Yeah. Um, and this is before he like went on Joe Rogan's podcast or anything like that. Um, and he, I began working with him um, as sort of as a, a patient, essentially, um, to kind of get to the bottom of my gut issues. And what we did was we we kind of um, started with like a full cleanse, like a, almost like autoimmune paleo type of diet right. for, I want to say I did that for close to six months. Um, and this was, this is when things were really, really bad. And that was, you know, shifting to that diet was definitely like the first time in a in in a long time that I had felt like a noticeable change in feeling a lot better yeah um and then we combined that with a, a protocol of a bunch of different botanicals that were sort of um like uh antibacterial and and um anti uh parasite and that really um I would say was what like healed me ultimately um I, I think there are there are other aspects to it that revolve sort of around the like psychosomatic angle that I've like really yeah. um, dove into lately and, and have a, a big appreciation for, which we can discuss later. But speaking strictly physically, it was adopting that diet. And, you know, I wasn't someone who ate the standard American diet. I was someone right. who, um, you know, cared pretty deeply about food. But I think sometimes when you find yourself in that position where you've been so compromised, the healthiest thing to do is to, um, is to to pursue whether it's keto paleo autoimmune paleo yeah. whatever it may be to kind of get yourself back to square one and i can totally. say now this is several years down the line i eat whatever i want i just prioritize quality of food i yeah. have no issues with dairy specifically or gluten or anything like that awesome. um and i think anyone can get to that place yeah. but i do think sometimes when you're when you're so compromised it's yep. a really useful to, tool to totally. help get you back to where you need to be Totally. Thank you for sharing that story. Cause there's so many people on that boat. And I, I really love hearing now that like you went through your, you went all in, you went all in on the healing, you did the work, but I love the message of hope at the end of like, I can actually eat some other things now. Like I, I, I focus on all these high quality things. That's, uh, and that's how I live too, but it's not yeah. going to destroy me if I have one other little thing. So it, it's just hope for healing. So I really appreciate you sharing that. And the, like the analogy I'd like to give is like when your gut is, is inflamed, uh, it's like having a big scratch, like road rash on your arm and then pouring vinegar or acid on, you know, some sort of vinegar on it. It's going to like keep it from healing. Right. And you're going to yep. have issues and it's going to hurt and it's going to be this big thing. But if you can l stop pouring vinegar on it, <laughs> stop pouring acid on it totally. and just let it heal, then you can pour vinegar on it all day long. It's not going to matter because you're healed. Absolutely. Right. So it's like the yep. gut. I kind of look at it that same way. It's this like mucusy lining open, you know, it needs time to heal. And then once it heals, there can be hope for a more normal life, you know, but I think what happens is people think I'm going to have to live like this the rest of my life. Like I'm never going to be able to have pizza. I'm never going to be able to have a freaking piece of popcorn or anything ever again. And so they go off. They, they like yep. Friday, Saturday hits, you know, two weeks later and they go have cake and, and chocolate and cookies and milk. And they're like, crap. And it just keeps yeah. staying in flame. So I appreciate you sharing your experience because there are so many people who can relate to that right now. So totally it's like go all in, heal that shit. <laughs> yeah. And, then, then and, and I, I think it's so important for people to hear those sort of like success stories that aren't just, you know, I decided to be autoimmune paleo for the rest of my life and I don't have any issues anymore. I think it's important for you to be able to hear people like me where it's like, I did that. I used it as a tool and now I'm at a point yep. where, where I can, you know, eat anything. And I really have come to appreciate the power of just, um, really understanding how capable the human body is of healing. And I think yeah. one of the sort of like mental barriers that held me back through that and other health issues that I've had is this idea of thinking about the human body as fragile um, and even thinking about my gut as super fragile. And you know, yep. at the time it was compromised, but the human body is incredibly capable of healing. I mean, coming back from things that you you would never think it could come back from. And I think people should start thinking about their 
bodies as really robust and really capable of healing and not being so worried about how fragile they are and that you know having one bite of sourdough bread is going to send you into this spiral or anything like that because right. i've actually come to believe that a lot of those reactions that we have that are true physical reactions actually stem from the um, sort of mental perception yeah. of what we're doing. I agree. I agree. I've seen it and I've actually experienced it myself. I got like so convinced that I had gluten issues when I mm-hmm. entered into the whole keto paleo world. Like I actually did. And then I was like, <laughs> I, I, I don't think that I do like, seriously, I got like diarrhea and stuff. I was like, what's going yeah, on with me? For sure. And, and then I was like, I, I, I really don't think I do, you know, like maybe sure. They say, some people say everybody has some reaction. Like I know there's a big Harvard study about that, blah, blah, blah. But I was like, I've always been fine up until I had this belief. And I was like, I'm not, I don't believe it anymore. I just don't. Yep. And I never had problems with it again, ever. Yep. So I, I like, I, that's just my experience, but I do like, I'm like, man, like think of the placebo effect. We know the placebo effect is real. And if every single thing you're putting in your body, you're like, this is going to hurt me. Then it is, <laughs> it's highly 100%. likely to. So of course there's an actual physical component, but that's like you said, the psychosomatic component is really real. <laughs> and something yep. I like, I love talking about this because I am in that healing world, the, you know, Mm -hmm. keto, paleo, uh, primal clean eating world, but it is something that I, it's a, it's a concern of mine that I've seen as I've been in this world longer and longer is that it feels like eventually people get to the place where they're afraid to eat everything. Like everything is going to hurt them. And I'm like, damn, that's no way to live. You know? So I appreciate you sharing that message of like, hold on, like question your beliefs. You know what I mean? Like question your beliefs about those foods and just really be real about like how they're affecting you instead of being like, I heard that's bad. So-and-so said that food's bad. Someone said that's bad, bad, bad. Is it though? Is it hurting you or your joints achy? Do you feel brain foggy? Do you have uh, bloating? Like, you know, kind of, I think it's important for us to, to question these dogmatic beliefs that sometimes we can get locked into for too long, longer than we need to. Yeah. And you and I discussed this, uh, on the weekend that we met, but one of the trends that I see that, that, um, like really worries me is this idea that we're going to so demonize bread, for example, right. that we're going to replace it with this keto bread. That's <laughs> got all of these like crazy isolates chemicals. and starches and chemicals and all of that. Right. And again, you might eat that and say, I feel better when I eat that than I do when I eat a piece of, you know, beautiful sourdough. But my guess is that that is sort of a a psychosomatic reaction to you're saying, okay, this doesn't have any gluten on it on the nutrition label. So I feel better, but take a step back and think like, is it really better for your body to be putting that in it versus, you know, something, you know, a sourdough bread that's made with three ingredients and is naturally fermented. And it's something that humans have been eating for, for so long. Um, and I see, you know, or, you know, another thing that I, that I've seen a lot of is with some of these trends, like whether it's, um, take keto just for example, but, you know, you see keto influencers who are saying, you know, buy bulk, uh, chicken thighs from Costco and throw three things of Philadelphia cream cheese in the, in the crock pot and blah, blah, blah. And yeah, on, on paper, the nutrition facts say that there's no carbs in there, but without any, um, sort of filter for quality of ingredients. I don't believe that that's true, healthy food or no. true, healthy eating. Right. Yeah. It's like, uh, you know, these chaffles and these things are really popular right now in the keto world. Yep. It's just like cheese with like low quality meat. And then like, yeah, like you're saying like cream cheeses and, and yeah. it's just like, man, like, ah, like it's it, it, to me, what it represents is this, uh, dogma that carbs are bad. So anything that's not carbs is good. And it's like, yep. okay, hold on, hold on. Let's like, 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 let's pretend that we live outside <laughs> and yeah. the only foods available to us are the <laughs> things that we find out there. Like, does the food that I'm looking that I'm eating on the daily, like, does it look like that? Or did it all come in a box and a package, you know? And, and that, I mean, yeah. that could take us down the road of processed treats and, and ice creams. And it, it's like, just because it is keto or paleo or whatever, like, we got to think about like, what happens after this goes on the inside of my body and our bodies are nature. We are nature. So of course we want our food to be as close to nature as possible. And this is where I actually want to transition into your spices that you created. Yeah. Um, because like, I just enjoyed a beautiful meal with my love and it was like rice and chicken and like salsa and all this good stuff and seasonings. And so it was so delicious. And I love your seasoning so much because you can make something very simple from nature like that, but you can make it taste 
bomb with like just one seasoning. So can you, can you tell totally. us about mother tongue? Yeah. So um, it's, that's actually the reason that we chose to, to have spice blend be our first product. Cause like I said, like we kind of consider ourselves a, a brand that is um, promoting home cooking, not necessarily a spice brand. We, we make spices as, as one of our products, but like our mission is around home cooking. But the reason we chose spices is because if you take someone who is a very, very basic home cook and like that guy that you described, they probably have salt and pepper in their pantry. You know, maybe they've got red chili flakes or something like that, that yeah. have been sitting around for you know yeah. a year. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if you're cooking the, the, cooking the same thing over and over again, what a spice blend does and specifically a spice blend, because that's one of the things about our format is that, you know, we've already done the, we've already done the sort of flavor um, concocting for you. You know, yeah. our blends have across the three blends, there's like 35 different herbs and spices in there. So you're getting super easy access to like a really big set of flavors. So you yeah. can take someone who cooks chicken thighs twice a week at home and, and uses salt and pepper on them uh, as their only go-tos. And they put the chilies or the savories or the herbs on there. And all of a sudden they're basically eating a different dish that's right. 10 times more flavorful and all they exactly. had to do was shake it onto the exactly. onto the meat so we saw spice blends as like one of the low like the lowest hanging fruit it's like such a low effort way to get access to really really big interesting flavors uh -huh. um and it's it's kind of foolproof and it's it's something that you can take even like a total novice chef and teach them how to do yeah. So, and also like, if you're in like the health communities and you're like really going after, maybe you're like counting macros and calories mm -hmm. or something like that. Like you're really going after a really specific goal and you find yourself eating like, okay, I have to have chicken and sweet potato or like, you know, just yeah. broccoli. I have three cups of broccoli. Okay. Like yeah. this is a way. It's always to... steamed broccoli and chicken breast for whatever reason. <laughs> yeah. I, like every time I see that on like meal prep Instagram, right, right. I'm meal like, prep oh salsa. God, they're... Yeah. <laughs> but, but at least like you can get some, even if you are doing that, no matter what you're doing, like you can completely change it up. You do the chilies. So the names of the spices guys are the chilies, the savories and the herbs, like you mentioned. So you yep. do the chilies, you can have this like Mexican dish, right? You have yep. this like amazing, and then you do the herbs. It's like you're on Thanksgiving, you know? And so it's, um, it's really cool to have stuff like that. This is all I use by the way. Like I do have <laughs> other spices and seasonings, but I just like to like, let's say I'm making, um, a roast in the crock pot or something like yep. that. Like, I don't have to do anything. All I have to do, I throw some salt and this in there and then I don't have to do anything. And it's like, oh my gosh, this is so good. I'm like, yeah, I know it's so good. You know? <laughs> like, so, <laughs> so like that to me, that's the secret of being able to, to, to make food at home and like it long-term is the seasonings. Otherwise it's going to taste like crap. Like that's, yeah. I would say you're the problem you're solving here is actually quite huge because that's why people don't continue cooking at home because they don't know how to flavor, say flavor totally. anything. And so you are like, I'll do it for you. Like here, just put yeah, this on you, your food. You, so many people are like, I don't cook at home because I can just never make it taste as good as it can right. at restaurants. And it, right. Spoiler, you can make it taste as good as it does at restaurants I, or better. I mean, um, that's, I have a hard time eating at restaurants because I like to cook. I'm like, when I. I get a meal at a restaurant and I'm like, oh, it's like not even as good as what I make. That's like, oh, uh, and it costs that's, four that's times That's the much. worst. Yeah. That yeah, sucks. exactly. When you, when you're like, I really could have done this better. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah. And like the other thing about spices is like you mentioned, it's, they, they are universal in, in cooking and in almost all uh, cultures have, have some form of spices that they use. And yeah. there's actually like taking similar spices, but in different combinations can transform a dish from like feeling like, uh, you know, like it's a Chinese dish to yeah. feeling like it's like a Mexican dish or an Indian dish or things totally. like that. And there's a lot of overlap between what they use. You know, chilies are used in all three of those cultures I just mentioned, but different types of chilies right. and, you know, right. along with whether you combine it with like cumin or ginger or whatever. And so I love that, that you kind of get access to these like different global flavor profiles yeah. based on um, what kind of seasoning you use. Yeah. And the other thing, like <laughs> just being real, when I first started learning how to cook and I would see like, like 
like Mexican blend or something on a, on a spice bottle or like, like savory blend or whatever, I would look at the back of it and I'm like, what did they put in here? Like what, so what is a Mexican blend? Like, I didn't know, you know, like what do they, and I'm like, Oh, okay. Paprika. Like I'm like learning. I'm like, they put paprika in Mexican food. Okay. Got it. Oh, chili powder. Okay. Okay. Cumin. Like these are all. And then what's cool about getting blends like this is like, you learn from the blend. Like, so, you know, for yourself later on, like, okay, if I'm going to make Mexican style stuff, like cumin, chili powder, paprika, like those are the kind of things that I'm going to want to put in there, you know? So totally. it's, it's a, it's like a educational <laughs> experience if you look at it that way. So, yeah. 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 And actually <laughs> it, it, I thought you were going to go another direction when you said you would look at what's in them because there are spice blends where you look at what's in them and their first ingredients are like uh, sugar or MSG yeah. or, True. um, like all sorts of like they, there's a lot of like anti-caking agents is yes. what they call them yeah. um to to prevent them from clumping and the truth is like if your spices clump a little bit it's it's not a big deal at all you just give the jar a shake, shake. Um, there's yeah. no reason that you need to like throw some uh right. chemical anti-caking agent in there um preservatives all that so our spice ones don't have any of that if you look at the ingredients it's a hundred percent organic spices that's it yeah. um and i only want to sell a product that is something that I actually use in my home kitchen and is exactly the type of product that I like to use. And that's what this is. And yeah, um, it I, was, it was harder to get them made that way. You know, it like, it yeah. took longer and yeah. all that, but it, it's just like, we, we believe in that approach and we wouldn't do it any other way. Yeah. I love that. Cause like, and they'll put sneaky things too. Like it'll say maltodextrin or dextrose or like, you know, things mm-hmm. that you don't know are sugar totally. and it sucks to be adding sugar to your food like that when you don't need it like at all. Like you don't these need it. Yeah. He's so good. So yeah, it's, it's nice. Like if you're looking at your, at your spices, like I really recommend people do this, like your barbecue sauces, your spices, like all of it, like look at the back, see what's like actually in there. If there's anything in there that isn't like just pure, healthy, real herbs, spices, vinegar, whatever, like it doesn't need to be in there, you know? So yeah. if like, if it's not a real word, <laughs> you're like, I know what that is. Like that's yeah. going to go. So yeah, I appreciate it. And also you, you should ask yourself, like, why did they need to put this in there? Is it because yeah. it comes from a, you know, supply chain that's going to have it sitting on a truck going cross country and then on a, you know, with a distributor and then on a grocery store shelf for months and right. months and months. And it's designed to sit there. Like having come from Mexico, I, I spent a little bit of time working in the like world of tortillas And like Mm -hmm. when you go see corn tortillas at the supermarket that are like sitting on a shelf, like not refrigerated, look at the ingredients and it'll like shock you because they're, they're not meant to be a shelf stable product in order to make them last that long. They have to put crazy stuff in it. Um, and what do you, what do you curious? Sorry, I have to ask. What do you, you, when you make a corn tortilla from scratch, what do you, what's in there? Uh, masa masa and and masa flour? and salt yeah and salt i mean like water? i that's it yeah so i make corn tortillas all the time and you uh in order to make them at home you use something that's called masa arena yeah which yeah. is dehydrated masa flour yeah and <laughs> the the big company is called maseca um which is like well, the one that's all over mexico and, and uh-huh. all over the united states and i would not recommend using maseca it's got uh-huh. a lot of like really nasty ingredients uh-huh. widely available is uh, bob's red mill makes a good masa arena and okay. then a company that I actually used to work with called Masienda makes like an heirloom quality masa arena that you can buy online. That's incredible. And that's what I use at home. Um, Is it like M A C I? M A S I E N D A. Okay. Yeah. Good to um, know. Yeah. It's, it, 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 all their products are really good, but their masa arena, especially, I go crazy for. Um, but it, what I was going to say to that point earlier is like, whether it's the sort of sauces and condiments that you mentioned or the, um, you know, tortillas that we're talking about, a lot of this stuff you can make yourself at home. Um, and it'll, yeah, it'll like take longer, but it'll taste better and it'll be so much better for you. And that's one of the things that I love about like teaching people to cook is they go from thinking that they have to buy all these things pre-made to realizing so much stuff. They, they can make it themselves and make it from scratch and it'll be so much better. Yeah. It's so much better. Like those little like mission tortillas and stuff like those are yeah. so gross compared they're to so bad. a I homemade know. tortilla that like, it doesn't take that long to make you just stir the stuff up real quick and like roll yeah, it up. Totally. It's like not a lot of work and it's like a million times better. And the other thing too, is like, I feel like when you're cooking, you're, you're so connected to your food. You're not like waiting for Uber eats to come and just scarfing totally. it down. Like you're like, you're taking your time. I, I find that people who cook at home, I feel like end up eating less because 
there's a, there's a slowness to the whole process Absolutely. that allows you to slow down. You know, usually you're, even if you are eating by yourself, you're still going to like savor it more yep. because you made it and you want to see how you did and what it was like. And you appreciate yeah. the work that was put into it. So yeah, it's, yeah. There's, um, you know who there. Michael Pollan is, right? Yeah. Yes. So he has this like diet philosophy thing that he's talked about that I actually think is like pretty awesome. But he basically says like, eat whatever you want, as long as you cook it yourself. So like, if you're craving wow. donuts, cook them yourself. If you're craving French fries, totally fine to eat them, but cook them yourself. Love and it. the reason is that one, you, you're you're simply not going to eat them as often because French fries, they, they take a lot longer to, to do at home than just going to the restaurant and buying them. But right. also you're, you're actually going to use real ingredients to make right. them, you know, because you have to go out and buy potatoes and then you're going to go, you know, and buy your oil and all of that. And I think that is, I mean, that's kind of how, how I uh, like live life now. Like I don't necessarily consider any type of food um, like bad yeah, or, right. um, or I should say, again, I don't consider any specific dish like, oh, that's totally unhealthy. Like I would eat poutine if yeah. I, you know, made it myself and it's a treat and all that. And I yeah. think that's totally fine. I agree. And I, one other thing, the time. Okay. So like time, right. Yeah. So you're thinking French fries, like make them at home or go get them. I'm going to go get them. But I actually, I, I think that you can save a ton of time if you cook at home more, because once you get in your groove and you kind of have like your set things that you tend to make a lot and like, you just have the ingredients on hand, it is way faster to just walk in your kitchen, chop up a potato and fry it than to like sit in line at McDonald's, wait for it, like drive around or go to a restaurant. There's been so many times that I'm like, I'm just going to go home and make something. And I'm like, dude, I, I finished making this probably by the time my server way before my server would have brought out food at a dine in restaurant or something like that. So I think like once yeah, you get absolutely. in the flow of cooking at home, like I feel like I save a ton of time and money, right? I, and it tastes better and it's healthier. So it's just like win, 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 win across the board. Totally. So, totally. Yeah. And the better you get, the the more you cook and the better you get at cooking, the easier that becomes. Yep. That's um, right. So it's like, worth the investment. Yeah, absolutely. Because you'll, you'll, you'll just get to a point where you can open the fridge, see what's left over and throw something together that is like really, yep. really interesting and fun. And that's like, that's that level of just like intuitive cooking that I think right. is where, uh, that's like where I want to get people where you can just yes. say like, I don't need to follow a recipe. Like, I'm just gonna, yes. you know, I'm gonna have a, I'm gonna have my pantry that's got kind of my staples in it. Yep. And then I'll see what vegetables do I have? What, you know, okay, I've got this leftover rice. I've got some like chicken that I can grill up. And then yep. you end up throwing something yep. together that's very intuitive and, and very yeah. fun. Yes. I want everyone to be there too. It's so beautiful. It's creativity, it's freedom, and it's yep. so much better for you. So Miles, thank you so much for coming on. Absolutely. And thank you for having me. Today. Yeah, guys, you can find Mother Tongue. Go to cookmothertongue.com. We'll put the link in the show notes and also on Instagram. It's at cookmothertongue, you said, correct? Yep. Yeah. Okay. On all like social platforms at cookmothertongue. We're awesome. on TikTok now. We're doing uh, YouTube. So um, yeah, find awesome. us. Awesome. Guys, okay. guys, go support them. Like there, you guys are like entrepreneurs. You're doing an amazing job, but they're, you're still a small company just getting started. So if go follow them. And if you guys like their content, please share it so that they can build more of a community and push forward in this mission of helping people learn how to cook at home. It's really important. Thank you so much for sharing everything yeah. you did today. Yeah, absolutely. And like, we love hearing from people. So if you have any questions, shoot us an email, shoot us a DM. We'd love to talk cooking. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for having me on. This was an awesome conversation. It was. Thanks, Miles.